Hello and welcome to the second episode of Monday Morning Manager. My name is Dylan Meehan, I'm a writer for City Extra, and this week, this episode is going to be focused on Manchester City's 1-1 draw against Newcastle at St. James's Park. This week's guest is Alex Michelle, a Manchester City content creator, and I'm excited for y'all to hear what he has to say about this past week's result. Without further ado, here's the interview. Alrighty, and we are here with Alex Michelle, Manchester City content creator, FPL expert. Uh, we're chatting just hours, honestly, after the uh, the Newcastle draw. Alex, how do you uh, how do you feel about the result? I sort of expected this result. I predicted two one yesterday, and then I was talking with a friend. And I was like, "It's going to be one one, isn't it?" And that's what it ended up being. I don't think it should come as too much of a surprise. It's still disappointing, of course. But given the lineup, which we'll talk about, given the <laughs> circumstances of no Rodri, no Kev, no Phil, I mean, you can't really hope for that much more, I don't think. I mean, St. James Park is always a really, really tough place to go. And, you know, Newcastle weren't in the, the best of form coming into this, but they're always such a tough test. And I don't think we did ourselves any favors either. Yeah, I mean, I think the the lineup is a fair shout, and we'll get to that in a second. I think by the last two times to St. James Park, it's Oscar Bob's winner last year, which kind of like helped really kickstart the run. And then it was two years ago, early in the season, when it was the 3-3 draw, when it was like, that's the first time there were questions being asked of Kyle Walker, when ASM just made him look like, you know, <laughs> for the first time made him look like he was not the most athletic person on the pitch. Um so yeah, I definitely agree with the, hey, it's St. James Park. Hey, we're out our I would, probably three best players other than Holland. I mean, obviously with, with Rodri, Kevin, Phil only coming on for the last 20 minutes again. So the Watford match, I'm not going to put as much thought in from uh, as like, hey, this is what we're like without Rodri, just because it's not anywhere close to the same level of competition. But against a, maybe not necessarily a top six side, maybe a top eight, top nine side, how would you feel that maybe at least Kovacic and Rico played together, or is it more of frustrations from other areas of the lineup? Yeah, I think the I think the midfield was all right, you know. I mean, we saw in the initial few games of the season when Roger was out then that, you know, they were performing fine and we were able to get results through that. What was shocking to me was the winger selection and the just the, the sort of like attacking four behind Holland, because I look at that four. And if Grealish is the most threatening player of an attacking four behind Holland, then I think we have an issue. Like, I love Grealish. I think he's great. I think he has a role in this side. But that was an issue to me. I was really surprised that neither Doku or Savio started. And yeah, I think we sort of paid the price for that because you look at the performance and, you know, Pep, Pep said in his, his presser before that we're not going to win those those midfield aerial duels. We're probably not going to win the physical duels. You know, they have Joel and Tim, they have Tonali. They're going to be able to sort of outmuscle us there. And you need to get ready to win those second balls and be able to, you know, find solutions in other ways. And I, I think we did that in midfield relatively well. I don't think that aspect of the, the sort of like control of the midfield was too much of an issue. I don't think there were any real standout performers in midfield, but it certainly wasn't, you know, a disappointment. Well, it really was just for me, you know, waking up at that early of an hour, and I know my other American friends share the same sentiment here, seeing that lineup was just not the best way to start the day. And I'm someone who's who's typically like an early person for these early game or morning person for these early games. Like I love waking up for a 7.30 a.m. kickoff over here on the East Coast. But yeah, it was just a bit disappointing. And then you you watch the performance, and to be fair, I did miss the first 15 minutes, which I think there was uh, an Akanji shot and a Holland shot as well. So a few chances there. But from what I saw throughout the rest of the match, it was really just that chance creation that was an issue because we don't have someone... You know, if you throw Kev there instead of Gundogan, if you throw Phil, as we saw for the last 20 minutes, then instead of Gundogan, then you get a bit more motion going there in in the attack you get a bit more you get a, a higher level of threat and without them it was just a sort of I don't know it just felt like a a blunt knife just trying to beat down a Newcastle and they were just able to sit back and be like what are you gonna do with that yeah 
Yeah, it. Uh, first off, I just want to say the 7.30 a.m. talk is really awesome to hear coming from L.A., where it was a 4.30 a.m. kickoff here. Um, fortunately, the 4.30 a.m. kickoffs, it, it usually go one of two ways. It's either like an mm-hmm. absolute beatdown. I think of like the Arsenal 5-0 from a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. That was the first 4.30 a.m. kickoff mm-hmm. that I had since I moved to L.A. Oh, from God, the East Coast. Uh, but I also then think of the... Uh, what was it? The Bruno goal in the in the draw, like the the offsides, like when uh, when Rashford was supposed to be offsides, yeah, yeah, or Bruno yeah. was supposed to be offsides when they uh, messed with the kanji. That was a four thirty a.m. kickoff too, and I just had to spend the rest that, of my that, day that's the like that. Yeah. Um, but specifically with the with the lineup, Bernardo, it seems like he's he's just kind of put out on the right wing, and whenever he's there, it just feels strictly <laughs> from a control standpoint, <laughs> like he's just. He's just there essentially as a warm body and it's a discredit to him and his ability because it just doesn't seem like he's going to thrive there anymore like he did early in his city career. And then if there's not going to be Savio, no Doku or no Foden on the right, there's just no real attack there. It's just there to retain possession. Yeah. And it leaves it all on essentially Grealish to create. I think Gundogan had the one chance, the one long ball that he played right to Holland, which was honestly, it was the only decent part I would say of Gundogan's game. Uh, was that one thing, and, and it was too. Holland wasn't really able to, uh, to get a hold of it because it came in kind of on a volley. Hmm. But I just, I just, I'm, I'm surprised. I maybe immediately just transition it to Foden. Do you just not think he's fit yet? It's two sub appearances where he's played 45 minutes, and then two other appearances where he's played in the last like 20 or so, and then the start against Watford. I'm, I'm a little confused as to why he's not playing more. Yeah, I think it really is just the sort of management and easing him back in. I think they might be a bit more reserved with that after seeing what happened to, you know, obviously Rodri's injury is not necessarily of that nature. And Kev is older and, and it's Kev, but I think they are probably just being a bit careful there. And I do think that Pep really trusts in Gundogan still. Uh, I don't necessarily know if I trust in Gundogan the way, same way that Pep trusts in Gundogan, but... I think he trusted in him enough to, you know, not be forced to throw Phil out there. I think it was a bit strange to to hear Pep say that he was ready to play 90 minutes and then see those 90 minutes come in a cup game. It was yeah. a, a bit strange. But then again, watching that performance against Watford, he did look pretty rusty, to be honest. You know, absolutely. he's had some time off. I'm sure his, his sort of like weight and, and muscle dropped a little bit from that and he's probably just not 100% ready to go yet. And so it is best to sort of ease him in, especially with the way the the fixtures are coming thick and fast, even this early in the season. So I don't think that there's too much noise to be made of that. I think I would be really surprised if when we play Fulham in the next Premier League game, that he doesn't start there and isn't ready. I mean, maybe if if Kev is back, we don't know his, his injury status yet, but if he's back, then maybe it's a different conversation because you can get away with that. But if Kev's out still and, and Phil isn't starting that game, then that's when my eyebrows will start to be raised. I'll be like, really, what's going on here? But yeah. I think we just have to have to give it time a bit. Yeah, I I agree. It is weird. That, obviously, Gundogan was an instrumental player in the treble-winning season. Goes to Barcelona. Last year, he led, I think, all of La Liga, not just Barcelona, and chances created. And I'm pretty sure the stat was that he's had more chances created for Barcelona than... And like any year since, like Xavi did under Guardiola at Barcelona. Well, I didn't know that. So just I know he left, purely left from league, a didn't know that. For, like I think it was around like ninety-seven chances created. Um, and granted, it's a different system. He has to switch leagues again. He's too. He's you know a little older. It seems though that it was like this was he was rough today in a way that I'm not normally used to him having issues. Like I haven't felt this way about a performance since the double pivot season in 1920, where it's just like, well, you know, and I guess it's like, hey, he's he's at the age where he's at now. He's he's entering his mid thirties. I personally don't think that this is going to be the gun to win that we're going to see for the rest of the season. But is this a I mean, where are you at, I guess, with his performance? No, I would agree with you. I think it's not that much of a cause for concern and you know, I, there might be something to be said about the, the sort of physicality of the Premier League as opposed to, to La Liga. I don't know how much I believe in that necessarily, but it's something to throw out there as an idea. I do think one aspect of the game that we saw today is a lot of the game was being played in these sort of like half transitions almost. It wasn't like a full transition back and forth yeah. game, but it also wasn't full settled possession. And I mean, we saw with the one chance where he tried to lob the keeper, it just... 
first of all, it looked like the defender was going to catch him after that first yeah. touch. He didn't really have the pace to break away. And then it just seemed like it got a bit... It, it's weird for a good one to get flustered like that, but it seemed like he just made the wrong decision in that moment. Yeah. And yeah, I think I agree with what you're saying, that like in a few games' time, once he has a bit more, you know... I don't know. I was about to throw the word experience out there, which is crazy. Again, the same with good one, but like a bit more time with this, with the team and just like feeling, feeling yeah, yeah. settled, I guess. Yeah. It's just like, he should be able to, to shake that rust off a bit. And hopefully this is probably the worst performance of the season for him or one of the worst that we'll see because yeah, it really was not a situation that suited him. And I think you look back to the trouble season and the role that he played there and a lot of the games were ones where he didn't really have to do that, that sort of like transition work and have to deal with a midfield that was as strong as Newcastle. So I think you can probably put a lot of that down to the factors of today's game. But at the same time, then again, I would just look back at the selection and be like, so why are we relying on him in these sort of yeah. game states to do that? Yeah, and especially then wait that long to bring Phil on because it was clear that like it just it wasn't working. Yeah, I didn't. If he had shipped it with the first touch, I wouldn't have as much of a problem. Mm. But it was then once he like at clearly by then Pope was already back in position. And it just <laughs> I, don't know, it, I was yeah. I was surprised for so yeah the, the best point for someone that is rarely flustered. He has mm-hmm. so much experience playing. It was a it was a strange strange coming from him. And then I guess to kind of then lean it more on Grealish, you had talked about before as being kind of the the only playmaking you know, the only real playmaker on the um, on the pitch. So he's he's got assists and back-to-back matches. First time he's done that this season. First time he's done it since December of last year. Uh, granted, you know, for a variety of issues from fitness, partying, whatever you have, it hasn't played a ton for City uh, over the last, I guess, like say nine months. Um, according to Stats Muse, he's the uh, he had five chances created, five fouls uh, won, and then also he won eight duels. In the last ten years, that has happened only once. Funny enough, it was Grealish for Villa during the COVID season. And then same thing for Squawka uh, saying those five chances and five fouls. It's happened 13 times uh, since 2020 and Grealish has done it six of those times. <laughs> so it seems like he's kind of back in his game, essentially. You know what I mean? He is performing to like what we have like seen Villa Grealish to be. And he was, you know, actually attacking, did great to set up uh, Guardiola for the goal. Do you think that he's kind of right now, he's retaken that left wing spot from Doku? I know that's been a constant talking point. Or do you think that it was just, hey, it's one match and and we'll see? I mean, I do think that Grealish is getting back to his best in a city shirt. I think he's slowly approaching that level once again. And I do think that a lot of that goes down to not only the sort of like rhythm, but the confidence that he seems to be playing with and he seems like a guy who sort of wears his heart on his sleeve in many ways. And I think he had a tough season last season. It's it's no secret, but he really seems to be getting that confidence. And with that confidence comes the ability to just really be like you were saying, put up those crazy stat lines pretty much and, and be able to control the game and be someone that Pepin City can really rely on. And I think when he's at that level, he's instrumental for City because he just, you know, People throw out the word control with him so much, but he really does offer that. And he offers, you know, a decent amount of creativity as well. I think when it comes to the the age-old conversation of him against Doku and and where that's balancing, I think the thing that I've been looking at this season is, okay, Grealish is seemingly getting better and better from where he was last season. And it's really, really nice to see the performance that he's putting in. And on the other side of the, the coin Doku seems to be flatter than he was last season. And that's not to hit these two against each other. It's just, uh, just to independently look at what Doku has been like. I think for me, what my expectation this season was that Doku was going to take this massive leap up. I was thinking that I've seen it so many times. Exactly. The second season under pop. And along with that last season, I still think to the, to this day, I don't know if they, they combined for one earlier this season, but Doku and Holland, at least last season, did not combine for a yeah. goal. Yeah. I was thinking that, okay, he's going to take his time to bet in. The players around him are going to better understand these little mannerisms of his. They're going to know when he's going to the byline. They're going to know when he's doing that little shoulder check and, and turning his man. And they're going to be able to read that and everything is going to flow much better than it was last season. And we haven't really seen that this season. And on top of that, Doku is like, his bag just doesn't seem to be getting any bit better. 
And yeah. it seems like I, I don't necessarily want to put a, a confidence issue on him, but it, it doesn't necessarily seem like he can beat his man with these moves at the same rate that he was last season. I don't know if the stats would necessarily back that up, yeah. but when I was watching the game with my uncle this morning, he called to me, he, he uh, made a correlation between him and like James Harden playing like ISO basketball <laughs> and stuff. He was like, Drillish and Doku are like one-on-one guys. And I think with Doku, when you aren't able to beat your man like that and you can't you know really turn that and that's the main thing that your game hinges upon then you really have to look at okay what are you offering and I think at the moment since Doku isn't necessarily offering that I think Grealish is in that pole position to be you know the the quote-unquote first choice guy for that role so it's a tough one and I do think that you know maybe similar to, to the Gundo issue that Doku will just take a bit more time this season maybe he just needs to settle into this season a bit more but at the moment, yeah, it is, it is a bit of a worry. And with the way that Grealish is on the ascendancy, it's it's hard to say that he's on the pole position there. Yeah, I mean, when you look at the Doku stats from last season where it was just like he was so farther ahead than any other player in dribbling, if that dips, even if it dips 10%, like mm-hmm. it is, it starts to become that thing of like, well, you were on, you're on the pitch for this one thing because you can do this better than anyone in the world by such a wide margin. But if you're not offering that, it's it's a problem. Yeah. And so I guess that brings it to the other area. So if, if Grealish seemingly is going to be getting a lot more of the run at left wing, we'll see with obviously all these games that are going to be coming in, uh, ahead in October. Um, it seems that with no Rodri, similar to how it was when it, the similarities between 1920 are really kind of starting to be there. It feels that control might be coming back. Granted, it's a way against the top side that loves to counterattack. And this Newcastle side has picked Pep apart before it may just be a one-off but it seems that control might be might be back on the menu for for the foreseeable future do you feel the same way I actually don't to be honest and the reason that I say that is I think I look at the lineup that was put out today and when you look at that on paper it screams control because you pretty much have four midfielders behind Holland plus Kovacic plus the back line and if you don't have those risk takers in Phil, Doku, Savinho, Kev, four players who are probably the, the riskiest players in the squad, the way that we were losing the ball today, and again, as you said, it might just be Newcastle, might just be an anomaly, but it felt like we were losing the ball at a similar rate to what normally occurs. Yeah. And, okay, maybe that's uh, something where the guys who are in that lineup hadn't played together this season before they need to get used to each other a little bit more maybe there's something there but for me when when Roger got injured and I was thinking over things in the few days following the thing that came to mind for me was that this season Pep might be able to relinquish control more than before and it does seem like he's still like clinging on to that and I think we will have games this season that are more about that because if you don't turn the ball over, then the deficiencies without Rodri don't necessarily come to the forefront as much. But at the same time, I think when I look forward into the rest of the season, I personally hope and, and I think logically speaking that we will have a few performances where Pep will potentially embrace a lack of control. Maybe that's also down to the opposition thinking that they have you know, some edge on us and are able to take it to us a bit more and are a bit more, uh, you know, open and less reserved in their approach. And that's something that I've been screaming out for, for, you know, ever since Holland came to City is that if you're able to open up the game and play more transition ball, the one performance that always sticks in my head is the 6-2 against Luton last season when Holland scored five. If you're able to do that, then the sky's the limit for for these guys. And you really play into Kev's game, you play into Holland's game, you play into Savinho's game as well. So for me... I'm not, I don't, I don't know if I buy into that yet. And, and what I was thinking ahead of this match was that, okay, it might, it's not going to happen immediately, but longer term, I think we might see some performances where control might be thrown to the side a bit and we just go yeah. almost all out attack in some, in some ways and really just try to, you know, outscore the opposition. And I was a bit, not disappointed that that didn't happen today, but this performance, you know, you know, it's just one off again. It's not something to take many conclusions from. But if this sort of performance happens two, three times over, where we put out a more control-oriented lineup on paper, and that control doesn't necessarily seem to be benefiting us, 
then what's the use? Why not change up the approach yeah. and play to something that, you know, is a bit more to the strengths of, of the key players? Yeah, I agree. I, I, I do agree. However, I just think of the 1920 season hmm. where it was just there, nothing ever changed. And granted, I guess the, the downside with 1920 is they went for control and they still conceded every counterattack <laughs> yeah, that any opposition well. team had anyway, so it didn't matter. So why not just go out all out attack? Uh, so we'll see. And I guess maybe more to kind of pivot more to a in-depth tactical side of things. Granted, it's been one or two games with no Rodri. We also have the, the beginning of the season as well where Kovacic and Rico honestly played really well for the most part. I still think Kova gives the ball away too cheaply at times. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, I think Rico's technical ability is, I mean, he's right up there with almost anyone else in the squad, especially in that midfield role. From the little bit that you've seen so far, is there anything that you've noticed or is there any trends that you've seen, you know, anything that you can speak to? Not necessarily. I do think that Pep is going to experiment a lot over the next period of, of games because we don't necessarily face a real threatening opposition until November, I want to say, when we play Spurs. Uh, I think you can maybe throw, I believe we play, I forget when we play Brighton, but somewhere around there. You know, once we get into November and then December especially, we have a run of games that is going to really test us. And like we've seen in past seasons, the initial period of the season up until around that same time that I just mentioned being November, December, January, Pep typically experiments with things. He wants to feel out the squad. He wants to give players opportunities to shine. And I think that's going to be the same thing that we're going to see over the, you know, the course of the next month or two. I think, you know, just as Pep mentioned in, in his presser, I think we're going to see Stones play as the six. I think we're going to see a kanji either play as a six or step into midfield at times in games like potentially against Southampton at home. I believe in game week nine of the Premier League season, we could most certainly see Gunduan play as a six in that sort of game. I think Pep's going to really test out a lot of these things. I do think that what we have seen so far in terms of Rico stepping up out of defense, which to be fair, we didn't necessarily see in, in this performance against Newcastle. That's something that we saw earlier in the season. But him playing as the right back and stepping up into that sort of right half space and support the midfield in that way, I think makes the most sense to me as the long-term solution. I think that is probably the, the one that you can rely on the most because it provides the extra support and it doesn't necessarily sacrifice as much as I think some of the other solutions do. We'll see what Pep comes up with. But I really do think that, you know, there's not much to go off of yet because yeah, we, we've yeah. only really seen like that one solution for a few games. And then, you know, today was a bit different and it felt like it didn't necessarily work. <laughs> so yeah. I don't know. I think it, it's one to come back to in a little bit once we see these very hits come out and maybe Pep will surprise us with something that we're not even thinking of at the moment. But yeah, it would be hard for us to, to say that there is a solution that stands out to me more so than, you know, Rico stepping up to provide that extra support in midfield, Vardiol from the left side, and then having, you know, just two center backs in, in Ruben and Akanji primarily who are going to just be sort of anchoring the back yeah. and and then the front five needs to sort itself out in one way or another. Yeah, and, and Pep, Pep, I think it feels like from a guilt standpoint, he almost has to play Walker after like blocking the transfer. <laughs> I just feel like there's just... Club captain Pep once has, again. Like, Kyle... Maybe. Kyle has some blackmail somehow on Pep, and he just really <laughs> basically just ever since he he didn't move to Bayern, he has to play. But it feels that having Rico step in more in at that right back spot, I would prefer instead of just having him. I know it's obviously the lineup is the lineup until the match starts, but it, it feels just from a numbers advantage standpoint better to have Rico at that right back slot slot in to give you the advantage versus him automatically starting in uh in the midfield because then it's walker is just essentially at that point a third center back but if there's a way yeah for them to have just the two anchors with Vardiol and enrico pushed up i think that's how you can kind of start to break it down a little bit more i think it's the only way where it's truly going to work looking ahead at the the next slate of games i mean it's it's a way to bratislavia on tuesday i think that game's going to be a slog i do not expect that to be a at all in an exciting game. And then, yeah, Fulham and Wolves before the, or just Fulham before the international break, actually. And then it's going to be Wolves and uh, back to um, another uh, Eastern European team for the Champions League after that. 
I, uh, it's, it's definitely going to be a like, Oh, Hey, is it working? Is it not working? We're so back. Everything's over. It's definitely feel like how it's going to swing for the, for the next few weeks. Yeah. I think it'll be a season of high highs and low lows. <laughs> <laughs> and I, to speak of that, I look, I do. I think Manchester city can absolutely win the premier league. Yes. Right now, I would say my confidence is potentially at the lowest that it could be. And part of it is just not knowing what the lineup is going to look like without Rodri, not knowing how long Kev's out, not knowing what how Foden's going to look. If Foden comes back and plays at the same level, perfect. If Kev comes back and plays at a level kind of where he's been at, if not a little bit higher, perfect. But I thought that maybe, weirdly, it's so early, but if that Leicester, if the Leicester Arsenal result, if Leicester were able to hold on to that point, I was honestly actually going to feel... 10 times more confident, but in Didi's leg just had to kind of ruin that dream. How do you feel kind of so far in terms of like outlook for the season? I mean, it seems like one where, you know, we have the trouble in our back pocket. The trouble is great. Who cares about the season? Like part of my brain is saying that, like just throw away any expectation, buckle up and try to enjoy the ride as much as possible. Yeah. Because same as you, my expectations and my, my sort of hopes for the season in terms of silverware is about as low as it has been in, since I can remember more or less. I do think that, you know, like I was getting at earlier, my hope is that we have some performances this season where the game becomes really open, which again, seems like, like I almost want this season to show us some of the most anti city city under pep football that we have seen under pep i want us to throw that aside at least in in multiple multiple instances yeah. it's not going to happen every game but i want us to be able to throw that aside and be able to play in transition it would help out nunez getting in the team as well who i think can play a role Absolutely. you know I, i've said since preseason that savino is this vertically oriented player and that's how you get the best out of him we know we know what holland is like and look at Some, the arsenal match yeah, I'm hoping we get yeah. some like really high highs from that where we can see that, you know, full throttle attack come into its own. And when that doesn't happen in the moments that it inevitably won't happen, you know, sort of like you were getting at, maybe it's Kevin and Phil that are sort of being the heroes in a way and setting up Holland and providing alongside Holland to paper over the cracks in, in some ways. But yeah, I think just to answer the question a bit more straightforward, like in terms of the, the Premier, in terms of the Premier League, I still have a, as a, about as much confidence as I think you can because I don't necessarily trust an Arsenal as much as some people do. Yeah, I think over the course of thirty-eight game weeks or now thirty-two game weeks remaining, Pep will find ways to grind out these results. Whether, like you were saying earlier, whether it is complete control. Whether like I'm getting at like it potentially might be complete openness and all out attack, whatever that approach may be, I trust in 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 Pep and more so the players to to really come through and get those results. I think the Champions League is a different beast. I have yeah. almost yeah, yeah. zero hope of winning the Champions League yeah. this season. Same. And then the cup competitions are sort of whatever. I mean, we have Spurs now in in the the Carabao yeah. Cup and the AFL Cup, and then the FA Cup. Who knows? I mean, who knows if we can get back to the the final again there? So. Yeah, I think the expectation is a bit low, but I think at the same time, that's okay. Because as much as we've got used to it as City fans, we don't need to be winning all the time. That's not like I'm saying, okay, just give the title to Arsenal or Liverpool. But at the same time, I think we can just throw away those expectations and just just try to get along for the ride and, and see what happens. Yeah, and I mean, I think the the one saving grace is I do think the Carabao Cup game for Spurs is right before their Villa match. I think it's like Palace, okay. then uh, unfortunately we're away at Spurs, which is already a debacle, <laughs> and then it's uh, and then it's in, uh, and then they, they they go to Villa as well. So that I think is the one saving grace is that that squad is not as deep, and so there's a chance they may have to rotate. But I'm never going to expect much mm-hmm. from Spurs away. Which I think uh, the Spurs yeah, weirdly, like the Spurs matchup is a great example of a game where you can just go full throttle with yeah, yeah. with Kevin yeah, yeah. Holland and potentially just blow them out of the water with goals. I think a, a return to Centurions football would be super interesting because there hasn't really been when it was Sterling Sane, you mm-hmm. know, just Fernandinho essentially as just the one person kind of holding back the uh, you know the defensive line. 
it would be it would be really interesting. I feel like, and Sam Lee has talked about this a ton. It just seems that the older Pep has gotten, ironically, though, just the more conservative he's gotten. And I, I definitely yeah. there's an obsession with control. I don't know if that's the Premier League. I don't know if that's just you know him in philosophy changing, the league changing to adapt to him. But it, there is just you know, especially in a project restart kind of COVID era where it was just the only thing mm -hmm. they seem to care about, especially with the false nine. Weirdly enough, as we're talking about this, and this is kind of a separate topic, I feel like Rodri being injured is the best thing that could happen for Pep resigning. Yeah, I was thinking that as well. If it's his, if this is his last season, a Rodri probably will now no longer win the Ballon d'Or. Mm -hmm. Granted, I mean it's kind of the most typical city thing ever to have like, oh wow, players finally going to you know win the Ballon d'Or, and his ACL just <laughs> completely ruptures just so, when that's so beginning painful. to look like a reality. Yeah. Uh, it seems that that's a great way to potentially, I mean, Caldun's going to pull every trick and every dollar and cent out of his bag to get him to stay. But it just seems that it's such an easy card of like, hey, you, you weren't even able to to see where this team could go because of this injury. And maybe it's just a one year extension. Maybe it's a two or three year. But I think that kind of helps the most. And if Arsenal were to win, I think that plays in the same thing. I don't think he wants mm -hmm. to go out on that, especially if it's Arteta. I do like Definitely. he's Definitely. a competitive person, yeah. <laughs> just like with Klopp. He he survived, like he out survived Klopp, mm -hmm. and I I don't I while I don't think he's going to out survive Arteta in the long term, I don't think he's gonna you know let this go after potentially just one loss that even happens. We still have you know thirty some odd games left. No, I completely agree. I, I've thrown it out there before that like. If there's anything that could keep a manager to stay for a tenth season, it's the <laughs> the prospect of coaching players like like Foden, like Oscar, because we we could talk about Oscar too and him not not being there until yeah, halfway through the season. You know, even Doku potentially Vardy, and now Rodri. Like you have all these players at your disposal. You want to get the best of them. You want to be able to you know make that team your own with them there. And as you're saying, he can't do that this season. Then. On top of that as well, I think Pep Pep has such a strong emotional connection to City at this point that knowing that next summer will be one of massive turnover, I think there's one side of the, the argument that you say you give the new manager time to come in and have that transfer window to make it their own. But I think another side of the argument is Pep might want to put his imprint on that next sort of generation yeah. of City as well. Yeah, he's already done it once with the like the turnover from what like the Centurions and um, you know, formidable season was to what it is now. It's already such a different squad. I, part of me does feel that he would want to maybe do one more shake up and he also has nowhere to go. Other if, if he's just taking <laughs> yeah. a break, there is no club that he can go to that is gonna offer anywhere near the same level. Yeah, it's either sabbatical slash life. retirement or yeah. stay at city. Yeah. yeah. Or it's you know, or he goes to the international game, which eventually when that happens, but I don't think I don't think yet. I agree. All right, last thing I want to talk about, it's kind of more of a, a fun one than anything else. Cole Palmer scores four goals. Um I, I tweeted out I had gotten a text from one of my best friends the the day that Cole Palmer had been sold, and it said that Dylan's gonna find out Chelsea bought Cole Palmer and shoot me at my wedding. Um while that didn't happen, uh, I do it it I think about it I think about that text after every match, after every goal that he scores. Right now the stats are looking at it's it's forty three goals and assists in thirty nine Premier League games. I think in total it's fifty goals and assists in fifty three games. Is this I mean I would say is this Pep Guardiola's biggest transfer mistake at City? Yeah. I'm has, stealing this question, by be. the way. I want to give I want to give credit. I'm stealing this from Amos Murphy. So <laughs> I apologize, funny. Amos. I'm stealing this from you, and I'm also then going to credit you that I'm stealing this from you. <laughs> I think it has to be. I don't see nothing else comes close in my mind. I mean, I think I think it is a, a, a massive mistake on his part to not have a player of that quality be someone who is getting consistent you know consistent cameos at the very least yeah. in those you know two seasons ago and then you look at last season and you know when Mara's left I was screaming that Cole Palmer is the ready-made yeah. replacement right there so are so many other people and I mean I, I will say massive props to Cole Palmer himself because he had such faith in his ability that he pushed for that move. And in the end, it would be hard-pressed for anyone to say that for his career, that was not the right thing to do. 
I think it was 100% the right move for him to make. And for me, I, I don't know about you, but Chelsea is a side that I don't necessarily hold as much, even, even with the Champions Same. League final. I don't yeah. hold as much of a resent for them as I do for Arsenal, for United, for Liverpool. So whenever I watch him, I have the same reaction as you where I look back at, at all the old all the old messages, all the old tweets, and I say, what could have been? But at the same time, he's never putting in these types of performances at City because you know that his role would be different and his minutes would be different. And so I think the silver lining of this is, first of all, that the world is able to appreciate the type of player that Cole Palmer is finally. I think secondly, people are able to appreciate the type of talent that the City Academy has and to be able to look at a player like that and say, you know, Oscar Bob is pushing into the City side this season or should have been. What is that talent going to look like in two or three years? What are these talents that are coming through next going to look like? And then I think the the third silver lining is, you know, that is, it's sort of a, a transfer policy of City. If a player wants to leave, you let them leave. Yeah. But I think in the future, whether it's Pep or a different manager, they're going to think twice before sort of excluding a player of that quality from yeah. the academy because you simply don't want that to happen, especially being to a rival in the league. Because if he had gone to, you know, a club in the Liga somehow or gone to the Bundesliga like like Elise did or gone anywhere else and been putting up this level of performance, it's not impacting you as directly as it is in the Prem, but... Yeah, I think I think there are a lot of lessons to be learned from it, but it's most certainly objectively has to be the biggest blunder that's been made in terms of the transfer business yeah. at City. Yeah, I think in it's a long like time, the, almost ever probably. There's kind of three that I think of under the Guardiola era. I mean, like one I guess is like potentially like Calvin Phillips and Nunez to an extent, just because the amount of money that was spent and how they haven't been able to to really make a mark, but yeah, it's either it's it's letting Palmer go, although he he really wanted to go, he been I don't fault it at that standpoint. If someone is that mad and they get that amount of money at the time for a player that had not played a whole lot, as I think as a city fan, I was like, Oh, well, that's, I mean, that is a decent price, but like, it was right at the edge where it was like, okay, I understand, but I honestly could have won more. But I feel like a lot of people outside of city fandom looked at that number and thought it was crazy without knowing like who's in Chelsea's backroom staff and, and really like who this player could be where they would be able to understand it. But yeah, it's either up there with like Sancho leaving, but again, Sancho mm-hmm. wanted to leave and he wasn't, you know, Jaden Sancho yet. It was, but we, people, I think of people like, you know, um, a scene company who were just like banging down the door that he was going <laughs> to be, you know, a world-class player yeah. and at times we've seen it, or it's just the, the inability to sign Messi. Like mm-hmm. those are kind of like the three for me to so fast forward it over Guardiola's entire career. There's two others that I can think of. It's Cruz going to Real Madrid. If you read Pep Confidential, that he did not want that. That was the Bayern mm-hmm. board selling it, but still, it's like under his kind of watch. And then uh, buying Zlatan for fifty million and getting rid of <laughs> Sam Milito, who immediately then goes to Inter Milan and wins a treble with Jose Mourinho. Where would you rank it in those three transfers? I think it's still top for me, probably, and I think. The reason being is, first of all, like you said, the the Cruz one, you know, wasn't one that he wanted to happen. And I I think that's a a bit of a different factor in there that something's out of your control a bit. And going back to the Palmer number, like from a business perspective, it's a transfer that makes sense. And like if the the manager has to write off on that for it to happen and the fact that Pep you know, in one way or another, whether it's just through the the management of the player not giving in those minutes or whether he directly said that Palmer could be sold, you know, that is his fault. And then I think to, with, with the the transfers in, in terms of Ibra and Eto, and then to bring it back to the, the city examples of Calvin Phillips and Nunez, I think the key difference for me between a transfer out and a transfer in is that when you transfer a player out, you know what you had before you lost it. Whereas when you're transferring a player and you don't exactly know what you have and yeah. transfers in, they, yeah, exactly. They can go whatever way, you know, we could have brought in Holland and Holland could have had the same injury record that he had before. And people would be looking at it saying, you know, maybe not, definitely not to the same degree, but you know, every single transfer you can put as a, there's a potential there for it to go wrong. Whereas transferring a player out like this, especially someone from the Academy 
you should know what the implications of that are and you yeah. should know what you're losing before you lose it. I don't think yeah. anyone who has tapped into the City Academy and how Cole Palmer was performing before he left City is surprised at the numbers and performances he's putting up. Like today we saw two outrageous finishes. We saw the free kick and then we saw the one yeah. where he slapped it near post. Yeah, yeah. Like that's nothing new to us. We've seen those types of moves before. The The near post one a bit different, but... You know, his shooting range when he was playing for the Academy was yeah, the just Academy as goals good are as we've insane. seen. They're incredible. The Academy goals are in- If someone wants to have fun, go on YouTube and look at Cole Palmer's Academy like goal catalog. It is absolutely insane. It's mind-blowing. And I think you can argue, like some people try to argue that, oh, it's, it's a performance for the Academy. That finishing ability does not get lost. Like, yeah. you're not putting... Clearly, a, we've seen it now. <laughs> you're not putting a ball 35 yards out of top bins, yeah. not being able to do that at any level. It's just the ability to get the space to do that. And yeah, I think it, I think it has to be the, the biggest mistake that, that yeah. we've seen from Pep's managerial career. I'd be hard-pressed to, to think there's a, there's a bigger one out there. Yeah, it's right up there, I think, with the, the Zlatan Eto'o one. That is like, yeah. and just that's more of like what then happened with like with the season and everything else. Yeah. And the thing is, Palmer, Palmer was a child, and now it's going to be like he will be a Chelsea legend now, <laughs> most likely because of that. Like, yeah, I don't, I don't think I'll ever leave that club, at least not until he's significantly older. Mm-hmm. I agree. It's hard to say. But uh, yeah, man, that's all. I, that's all I got. I appreciate you coming on. Uh, you're one of the first people that I talked about this show with, so I'm glad to uh, glad to finally have you on here. So I appreciate it. No, absolute pleasure, dude. Thank you so much for having me. And yeah, I'm really excited to see where this show goes. I'll be tuning in every every episode. I'm sure. Appreciate it. Thanks, man. And that's it for this week's show. Once again, a massive thank you to Alex Michelle. Everyone, please check out the social media handles in the show notes. I'd really appreciate that. Always remember to like, comment, subscribe, all of that fun stuff. And trust me, this is not just going to be a weekly recap interview show. I have so many ideas that I'm really looking forward to showing you all. But that's it for the second episode. Enjoy the rest of the week.